Good morning, Skyline. It's so good to be able to be with you again this morning to bring the Word of God. Uh, and I'm so excited. I've got a message on my heart. And this week, we come back to our series uh, on Strength Builders. Today, we're continuing that conversation about building faith and uh, resilience in hard times. How? By doing things that go in the opposite direction of the spirit of the times. The times that we are in are ruled by fear, by anxiety, by hopelessness, by a spirit of lack, by despair, by depression. And because these are the things that rule the spiritual atmosphere, as followers of Jesus, we need to go in the opposite direction. Compassion is one of the things that goes against the grain and will help us build strength and resilience in hard times. In 2010, the University of Michigan conducted a study on empathy and they surveyed 14,000 students from 1979 up until 2009. They found that empathy was down 40% with the biggest drop occurring in students from the year 2000 onwards. They found that compared to college students of the 70s, the 80s and the 90s, College students post year 2000, they were less likely to agree with states, statements such as the following. I sometimes try to understand my friends better by imagining how things look from their perspective. So students post year 2000 were less likely to agree with a statement like this. Here's another statement that they were less likely to agree with. I often have tender, concerned feelings for people less fortunate than me. Now, the study suggested a few reasons why we care less today. Uh, they suggested something uh, like increased exposure to media. You know, we just get bombarded by all kinds of news, bad news uh, mostly, and eventually we become so desensitized because we're just scrolling after post, post after post. It's the same thing and eventually you know, we just become desensitized. The rise of social media is another reason um, that, you know, why we care less today. There's a spirit of self-absorption and, and self-obsession. There's also this hyper-competitive atmosphere with inflated expectations of success that leads to this social environment that works against slowing down and listening, which leads to a lack of personal interaction. And all of these things combined together just makes it easier for us to not care. Now, if we've looked at a study of people who by their own admission have said they care less uh, today than people did before, what about other people on the receiving end, people who need compassion and, and care? Well, a more recent study by Barna in 2019 surveyed 15,000 18 uh, to 35 year olds, and they found that one in three of these 18 to 35 year old respondents uh, feel deeply cared for by those around them. Only one in three would feel deeply cared for by those around them. Um, only one in three, about one in three, would say that somebody believes in them. Nearly one in four would say that they encounter feelings of loneliness and isolation. We live in an increasingly polarized world that is really crying out for compassion. The study in 2010 showed us that. In 2019, the study just reaffirms that. And in our own personal experience with the pandemic, with political and economic instability, that's not isolated to our nation alone, by the way, um, and coupled with things like cancel culture, there's a dearth of compassion in our world today. What is compassion? Uh, Stephen Covey, he's, he tells of an unusual experience on the New York subway. Uh, while people were sitting quietly in the subway car, a man enters with his noisy and, and rambunctious children. And the man sits down, he closes his, his eyes as though he was just oblivious to his kids. And so the, the subway car that was once quiet suddenly became a place of crazy chaos and the children's inappropriate behavior was seen to be obvious to everyone except for their father. And finally, Covey confronts the man about his kids and the man opens his eyes. He evaluates the situation as if he was unaware of all that had happened. 
And he says this, oh, you're right. I guess I should do something about it. We just came from the hospital where their mother died about an hour ago. I don't know what to think. And I guess they don't know how to handle it either. Compassion starts when we begin to understand the hurts of others. You know, I so strongly believe that the church is called to compassion. And as followers of Jesus, compassion matters. It matters greatly to God because he is a God of great mercy and compassion. And this compassion is exemplified in the life of Christ all throughout the Gospels. As followers of Jesus, we are exhorted to make compassion an integral part of our lives. Zechariah 7.9 says to administer true justice, show mercy and compassion to one another. Colossians 3.12 tells us, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Now, in the Bible, the words for compassion in the Hebrew and Greek carry this meaning, to be moved inwardly greatly, to yearn with tender mercy, affection, and empathy for those who suffer or are vulnerable. But as we'll see, compassion is so much more than just a bleeding heart. It starts when we begin to understand the hurts of others but Christ-like compassion is more than a feeling. It should move us to take action. It should fuel acts of kindness and mercy. Now, who are we called to show compassion to? Sometimes it's very obvious who we should show compassion to. We think of the poor, we think of the hurting, we think of the sick and the suffering. And maybe during this pandemic, you've already taken action and shown compassion by giving towards, you know, things like food parcels, financial support, prayer support, encouragement. Praise the Lord. Don't stop. Keep up that wonderful work. But I think as we look at Jesus's life that we will see the kind of compassion that he shows totally knows no boundaries. Jesus reached out to all classes and all kinds, some of which might even surprise us today. You see, Jesus, he had compassion for the sick ones. There's a lot of scripture in this bit, but just take notes and you can look at them later. Uh, and so Jesus, we saw the first one, he had compassion for the sick ones. In Matthew 14, 14, this is right after John the Baptist had been beheaded. And that news reaches Jesus and Jesus in that space of grief and, and mourning uh, and, and tiredness, he, he withdraws by boat to be alone. But the crowds, they continue to follow him. They continue to pursue him on foot. And by the time Jesus landed with the boat, uh, he saw the large crowd of people who had followed him. And, and, and the Bible tells us this, he had compassion on them and healed the sick. In Matthew 20, uh, verses 30 to 34, there are two blind men on the roadside who are crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And scripture tells us that Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. In Mark chapter 1, verses 40 to 45, when a man with leprosy came and fell to his knees begging Jesus to heal him, we are told that Jesus was filled with compassion and healed the man. Jesus had so much compassion for the sick. Hey, while we're at this, you know, doing, reading your Bibles or whatever, I encourage you just note the scriptures down and, uh, you know, when you have time, go through and underline or highlight every time you see that Jesus had compassion. Every time you see that Jesus was greatly moved or that Jesus' uh, heart went out to someone, I encourage you to do that exercise uh, and see how that will speak to you. So Jesus, he also had compassion for those who were suffering. He had compassion for the suffering ones. In Luke 7, Jesus was approaching a town called Nain, and there was a funeral taking place. A dead body was being brought out uh, of the city gates, and it was the only son of a mother who was also a widow. And understandably, she was in great grief and sorrow. 
Now we know, because we can read the end of the story, that eventually Jesus will raise the son back to life. But what I love about this encounter is that Jesus, he does not just bypass this mother's grief and sorrow. He doesn't just go to the supernatural thing and raises the son back to life and then say, wow, that's been done. No, he takes the time before doing the miracle to go to the mother and comfort her. Scripture tells us when the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her. And he said, do not cry. Jesus also had compassion for the scattered ones. Um, you know, he, we read in Matthew 9, 36 and uh, later on as well in Matthew 15, 32, Jesus, he's going through the towns and villages and it says that he had compassion on them on these scattered ones because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Uh, in Matthew 15, 32, Jesus has compassion on this crowd of people. They come to him. They bring all their sick, all the lame, the blind, the crippled. And Jesus says, I have compassion for these people. They have been with me three days and have nothing to eat. I do not want to send them away hungry or they may collapse on the way. But, you know, Jesus, he also had compassion on the seeking ones. And uh, this account is to me one of the most poignant and moving exchanges that Jesus has in uh, what we know of his ministry on earth. An eager man runs up to Jesus. He falls to his knees. He says, good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. And he says, you know the commandments. And he lists those commandments out uh, for this man. And this man responds, teacher, all these I have kept since I was a boy. And the scripture tells us this, Jesus looked at him and loved him. And then he says, one thing you lack, go and sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasures in heaven. Then come and follow me. The Bible tells us that this man went away sad for he had great wealth. Now, I don't know about you, but that speaks to me in such a, meaningful and powerful way because Jesus had compassion on those who are seeking, those who find themselves caught in that tension uh, between wanting to follow Jesus and being beholden to other gods. And I think we all have someone like this in our lives. You know, Jesus' heart of compassion is for them. So should ours. Finally, Jesus also had compassion on the sinning ones. And, you know, we see this very often throughout the Gospels. Uh, but one instance I want us to look at today is found in Mark 16. And it's often uh, referred to as the restoration of Peter. In Mark 16, we are told it is the third day and a group of women are on their way to Jesus' tomb to anoint his body. And they get there and they're told that Jesus isn't there. He is risen. And uh, they're also told, go tell his disciples and Peter. He's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Why is it significant that Peter is mentioned by name? Because just a few days earlier, he had denied Jesus three times. The very thing that he probably thought he would never have done. And then we go to John 21. We see Jesus. He's waiting for the disciples um, and he has breakfast on the shore. And nobody dares to ask who he is because they know it's him. They have breakfast together. I can't help but wonder if it might have been one of the most awkward breakfasts um, in a while for Peter. But Jesus, in his great compassion and love, he reinstates Peter. And lest we forget, we too are sinners saved only by God's grace. We are recipients of this immeasurable compassion of God. And Jesus had compassion on the sick, the suffering, the scattered, the seeking, and the sinning ones. Why was Jesus able to show such great compassion to so many kinds of people in so many different types of settings and situations. Now, I believe it is because Jesus, even though he knew all their faults, he did not let that get in the way of his compassion and expression of love. He didn't just look at what was obvious on the exterior or on the surface. But Jesus was able to look at these people and see their deepest need. And seeing them at their deepest need, Jesus loved them from the deepest level of his being. And because of this, 
He was never impatient with them or offended by their needs. And this is my question for us today. How do we see people? We so often base our evaluation of someone on what we see with our eyes or what we hear with our ears. And in this day and age, far too often we base our judgment or evaluation of other people by what we are seeing and reading on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, or viral WhatsApp messages. We need to learn. Maybe we need to relearn to look past a person's exterior to see them as they really are. We must see their needs before we can express compassion to them. May we so long and yearn and learn to see them as Jesus does. How does compassion build our spiritual strength and resilience? I think it is important, it's good to distinguish between the feeling of compassion and the execution of compassion. Most people in the world would not recognize compassion as a strength, but it is. Because when compassion is truly felt, it builds our character and we grow in intimacy with the Lord. Why is that so? Because compassion is so close to the heart of God that when we feel compassion, when our hearts are deeply moved, we come into a knowing of Jesus' own heart as revealed in the Gospels. And compassion affords us the opportunity to hear God, to align our wills, our emotions, and our minds towards feeling as God feels for the poor, for the marginalized, for the oppressed, and for the unfortunate. It's not about our own feelings of compassion as much as it is knowing and communing with the God who is deeply compassionate. And there is a difference between godly compassion and soulish compassion. You see, godly compassion will find its roots and identity in a God uh, who, who is compassionate and in what Jesus has done on the cross. But soulish compassion often has at its root um, a hidden agenda or selfish motives or um, a patronizing disposition and self-pride or the need for recognition and achievement. And I think it is, it is wise to ask ourselves what our compassion is really driven by. The execution of godly compassion, on the other hand, builds our faith and resilience. It is that moment, you know, when we are filled with compassion uh, that we need to take the next step of faith to courageously take the risk to act on that feeling of compassion. You see, most times, true godly compassion will lead to execution because compassion isn't just something that we talk about. It's not just about verbalizing our feelings, but it is about execution. Compassion is not just something you feel, it is something that you do. And very often we will encounter challenges and objections when we try to execute compassion. What do we do? Do we give up? No, we press on, we overcome, and we break through. You see, compassion without execution is, at best, cultural fashion. And at its worst, it is delusion. As followers of Jesus, we need to be willing to take proactive stances and begin to live out compassion. Now, to help us unpack and understand this a little bit more, I want to revisit a passage of scripture that will be familiar to many of you listening today. It's found in Luke chapter 10, verses 30 to 37. And on this occasion, Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan. Let me summarize it for us today. We are told that there is a man who is going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he is attacked by robbers who strip him of his clothes, beat him, and they leave him for dead. A priest uh, also following that same road, comes along. When he sees the man, he passes by on the other side. A Levite comes along and he does the same thing. He passes by on the other side. But a Samaritan comes and takes pity on him. The Samaritan, instead of passing by and walking on the other side, he goes to this injured man. He bandages his wounds. He's, he pours oil and wine on his wounds to cleanse them. He then puts the man on his donkey brings him to an inn and takes care of him. He doesn't just stop there uh, because the next day when he has to go about and settle his, his business, um, he settles all the expenses with the innkeeper. He instructs the innkeeper to care for the man. And he says, if there are any further expenses that he will settle them when he returns. 
I just have three thoughts that I want to share from this passage today that I believe will help us to have a fuller picture of both the feeling and the execution of compassion. Now, the first thing is this. Compassion will very often interrupt our lives. Compassion will very rarely be a convenient thing. Just ask the priest, the minister of God who came by, saw the man and walked on the other side so he wouldn't have to get involved. He was a busy man. He had to get to the temple. Or ask the Levite, a theologian, a student of God's word, a man who was supposed to know the character of God. He too crossed over to the other side so he wouldn't have to bother with him. Maybe he was running late for his weekly Torah discussion group. The Samaritan comes and he could have done the same. But he slows down enough to come to where the man is. And when he sees him, he takes pity on him. How do we see people? Or maybe we take a step back. Do we even see them at all? Or have we, like the priest, like the Levite, become too focused and driven in our own pursuits that we have forgotten what it means to come to where people are at, see them with our hearts so that we may be moved with compassion. You know, when compassion interrupts our lives, it's not so much that it is an inconvenience to us. It's really an opportunity for us to get outside of ourselves, to get our eyes off ourselves. It is meant to take us away from the self-absorption and the self-obsession of this world that creeps into our daily life in an insidious way that sets us up for great destruction. And that is why when opportunity presents itself, we must choose to be compassionate. It is part of the journey of dying to our comfort. It is the antidote to our propensity for self-preservation and self-pride. To have compassion is an opportunity that we might learn to be yielded to God, to be able to truly mean it when we say, break my heart for what breaks yours. Compassion is an opportunity for you and for me to be molded into Christ's likeness day by day. Here's a second thought from this passage. Compassion will always cost us something. It costs the Samaritan his time, his energy, and his resources. Showing compassion meant that he had to use his oil, his wine, his donkey, his money, his time. Assuming that uh, they even thought about the injured man, the priest and the Levite were likely not willing to bear any such cost because they did not even slow down or get close enough to see what this man's condition was. Now, let's acknowledge that what this Samaritan did went far and above human obligations. Today, if we saw a beaten man on the road we would either leave really quickly because we're worried it's a scam or at best we would call 999 and then do what we can while we wait for help to arrive. But there was no such service on these treacherous and winding roads through the mountains from Jerusalem to Jericho. Whoever decided to stop and check on this man and found him alive would have to take on the responsibility and burden of his survival and safety upon himself. Either he got involved or the man died. There were no other options. And maybe when we see things in this light, maybe many of us would also hesitate because we've all got things to do, places to go and people to see. I do not know anyone who is not busy these days. Life's demands are real and they weigh heavily on all of us. And there is also that overwhelming feeling that you can't really save the entire world. I have a friend who is a social worker by profession and her area of work involves placing homeless people into temporary shelters and eventually to see if they can find um, these uh, people on more permanent housing. Many of her clients are out on the streets because of drug addictions, alcoholism, 
domestic abuse, broken families, and poverty. It's a tough job. You don't get a lot of wins all the time. Some days are extremely, extremely challenging, and not everyone can do what she does. It's really hard when you've managed to find uh, someone a home, and a couple of weeks later, they're back out on the streets doing drugs again, or worse, you know, they end up dying, which she's had to go through a, a few times. So the work is really heartbreaking. But if the work is hard and slow, the victories are real, and the work of grace is amazing in a broken life. And so my friend, she continues her good work, and I, I asked her, how do you cope when the work is so depressing, when the day can be so depressing and some days can be demoralizing? And she told me, I'm learning to not look at it that way. Don't let the darkness overwhelm you. Just light a candle and let it shine. Her compassion has cost her a lot, especially in a mental emotional and a social sense, but she has kept going. And I think that that sentence, you know, bears upon the lessons of compassion that we can learn from the Good Samaritan. No matter who you are or how much you care or how hard you work or how hard you pray, we can't save them all. We can't rescue every baby. We can't save every marriage. We can't help every single homeless and hungry person. Even Mother Teresa couldn't rescue every hurting child in Calcutta because the scope of work that requires compassion is just so great. The needs are here, there and everywhere and, and the cost is almost unbearable. But that is no reason not to help those whom God puts in your path. And I believe today that God has placed people in your life for you to be a conduit of his compassion. The only question is, are you willing to slow down, to stop, to see the person with the need and give up something of yourself to meet that need? The fact that compassion will always cost us something is really a reminder that whatever we have, including the very breath that we breathe, all belongs to God and whatever we are blessed with, we are blessed to be a blessing. So what do you do when the cost of compassion seems so great? And this is what my friend told me. She says, you thank God for what he has blessed you with and then you light a candle in the darkness and you let it shine. And so what does that mean? She says, light a candle in the darkness through prayer. Light a candle in the darkness by showing up and being present. Light a candle in the darkness by listening to someone else's story and holding space for their grief, for their sorrow, for their anger, for their trauma. Light a candle in the darkness through your giving, whether it's time or money or energy, whatever it may require. Light a candle in the darkness and let it shine. Here's the third thing about compassion. Compassion changes lives. The degree to which it changes the lives of those touched by compassion will always differ. Now, we aren't told what happens to this injured man in the parable. We don't even know if he actually eventually ever met the Good Samaritan who rescued him from his near death. Uh, in Luke 17, the account of the 10 lepers that Jesus healed, only one came back to thank him. Uh, in John 4, when Jesus showed compassion to the Samaritan woman at the well by speaking to her and speaking life into her, the internal change was so great that she ran back to her village to tell everyone what had happened. In the Synoptic Gospels, uh, when Jesus heals the woman with the issue of blood, we know that her life was changed tremendously because when Jesus healed her of her bleeding, he not only restored her physically, but he also restored her dignity as a woman in her community. She was no longer unclean. But here's the point I want to make. The execution of compassion doesn't just change the person who receives compassion. It also has the power to change our lives when we execute compassion. It changes our hearts. The experience of showing and extending compassion softens our hearts. It causes us to be tender and merciful. Why? Is it 
just because it's a good thing to do or a good trait to have. No, it, it is because and it is so that we would always be willing to be used by God to extend his kindness, his mercy and his compassion to others. It's because as recipients of God's grace, we have experienced compassion firsthand. God first had compassion upon us. Christ first loved us and went to the cross for us while we were still sinners. Romans 5, 8. God's great compassion has changed our lives. And when we measure our compassion against this biblical standard, I think we will agree that we all fall far, far short of it. I'm the same. I don't have enough Christ-like compassion for people. I need to grow so much more in this. And there is a poem by the American poet uh, Margaret Sangster that I think encapsulates this well. She writes this, It isn't the things you do, it's the things you leave undone that gives you a bit of heartache at setting of the sun. The tender word forgotten, the letter you did not write, the flowers you did not send, are your haunting ghosts at night. The stone you might have lifted out of a brother's way, the bit of heartsome counsel you were hurried too much to say, the loving touch of the hand, the gentle winning tone, which you had no time nor thought for with troubles enough of your own. For life is all too short and sorrow is all too great to suffer our slow compassion that tarries until too late. And I think many of us, we would share these sentiments. Very often it's not the things we do that pain us, but it's the things we leave undone. And the painful truth is we do not have enough compassion for others. But I want to say to us today, let's not be discouraged. Let's not be disheartened. Let's press on and build strength in this area of our lives. And just as it is when we want to build physical strength, you know, we work out, we train, we eat right. It's the same as compassion. It needs to be trained and compassion needs to be nurtured. It needs to be practiced. Otherwise, even this basic love response can grow dull and cold. And especially in a world that seems to measure compassion by the number of shares and likes and comments in a post. But today, you and I, we can make a fresh start with God's help. We can ask the Lord to help us to become more like Christ in being compassionate toward people around us. And then we must take action. It's not enough just to have a bleeding heart. You've got to take action. Now, I believe, like I said earlier, that there are people that God has put in your life who are going through really tough times and desperately need some light in their darkness. Some of them need the compassion that only you can give. Can I encourage you today? Light a candle and let it shine in the darkness. Some of these people, they need a word of encouragement and you are the only one who can give them that word. Others are staggering beneath a very heavy load and you are the only one who can le help lift that burden from their shoulders. Some of them are about to quit and you are the one who can keep them in the race. Many, many people have been hit with an incredible string of challenges and you extending God's compassion might be the one who can keep them going. You know, these people, they are all around us. Our problem sometimes is that we do not see them. Let's pray that God will give us the eyes to see the real needs of people we know and meet. You see them where you work. Some of them are your neighbors. Some of them, your kids go to the same school as theirs. God has been so graciously compassionate towards us for a purpose that we might take what we have received and share it with others who so desperately need it. Let's pray today. Oh God, we are so deeply full of gratitude for your compassion towards us. So often we take it for granted. We forget that your compassion came to us at such a great cost. And forgive us, Lord, for not being more aware of this, for allowing ourselves to be distracted by all sorts of things that hinder your deep work of compassion from fully transforming us daily. 
Today, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to grow in Christ-like compassion, not by accumulating deeds and achievements of kindness, but through a deepening of our walk and communion and alignment with you. Help us to see people the way you see them and give us the courage and boldness to step out of our comforts, to put away self-preservation and self-pride that we may truly be conduits of your compassion towards those who you have placed in our paths. Thank you, Lord, for speaking to us today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody says, Amen. Just one final thing before we close today and we do this at every service because we never want to miss an opportunity to give people an opportunity to respond to Jesus today. Today, you've heard so much about Jesus and his compassion. Can I say this to you today? If you do not know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, or maybe you once did, but you know that you have backslided away and you are far away from him, I want to encourage you, and I say this with all the love in my heart, that he loves you so much. He is greatly compassionate towards you. And if you would open your heart, invite him in, he would change your life, give you new hope and a new future. And so if that is you today and you want to respond to Jesus, wherever you may be watching this from, I invite you to say this prayer with me and the words will come up on your screen. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in the name of Jesus. I admit that I am a sinner. I believe Jesus is your son and that he died on the cross to take away my sins and he rose from the grave to give me eternal life. Today, I turn from my old way of living life and I receive you, Lord Jesus, as my Lord and my Savior, as my master and my best friend. Thank you for giving me new life, new hope and a new future in you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, you know, if you prayed that prayer today, hang around, don't leave so quickly. There's a QR code that will pop up and we have some people who would just love to connect with you. Uh, we have some resources that we would love to share with you to help you grow in this journey of, wo of walking with Jesus. And so if that's you, make sure you scan the QR code and uh, somebody will be there just to guide you. There'll be more information after this. But otherwise, everyone, God bless you. Let's continue to build strength in all these areas, gratitude, um, generosity, you know, and, and being blessed and today compassion. Let's continue to just grow these things all for the glory of God. Take care, everyone. We'll see you again next week. Wow. Thank you so much, Pastor Rach, for sharing with us the Word of God today, this morning. I believe that many of us have been inspired this morning and also being stirred in our heart. And if you have made that decision just now to follow Jesus, to give your heart to Jesus, we want to welcome you to this family of the Kingdom of God. And I want to invite you to just take one more step to scan the QR code that is shown on your screen right now. We would love to walk with you and to help you as you take this new journey in Christ Jesus. We are so excited for you and someone will be in touch with you soon as possible.